Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hello, team. Welcome to Liquor Live from Shopper Intelligence. I hope um, I hope you're all battling the cold snap wherever you are. I'm literally cold to my bones here. Uh, or better still, perhaps you're somewhere where you're not battling a cold snap. That would be nice. Um, stick it in the chat. Let's get, get a conversation going. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Uh, make us all feel jealous if you're somewhere in the world that isn't cold right now then um then tell us uh hi i think it's been a while it's been seven months to be exact uh, since our last session since our last one of these um let me take a quick moment to say thank you to uh to any one of you out there who asked for us to bring these back uh, quite a number of you said you found great value in them you hope that we do them again so um so thank you i appreciate it it's great to know that there is value in these uh, webinar sessions and um, and here we are it has been a long time between drinks, though. So, um, so let's reconnect. Let's make this a conversation. Tell us, please, in the chat, how are you? Are you well? Life treating you well? Are you winning in life? Are you winning in business? Stick it in the chat, folks. Are you good? Are you great? Maybe you're feeling bloody awesome this morning or something else. Let's get the conversation going early. Um, right. So what is what is this all about? Maybe you've been on one of these before. Maybe you haven't, but it's been a while. So let's just do a quick recap and refresh. We get a bunch of talented liquor pros. That's you uh, together for 45 minutes. And we look at what's really going on in off premise liquor right now. Why do we do that? Well, because we want you to have the best capability and the best ability for yourself and for your team so that when you're out talking to your customers, you have the best shopper understanding, the biggest influence, and therefore the greatest opportunity to take the lead and to win in your category. That's why we do it. It's as simple as that, folks. And, uh, and that's what this session today is all about. So today, uh hopefully you can see this on screen my uh, my little green border has just uh, Hannah give me a nod can you uh, can you see the uh, you could brilliant okay zoom just threw me a little wobbler there oh mark i knew you'd be somewhere nice mark's on the sunshine coast fantastic i hope you're loving it mate i hope you're uh, I hope you're in your boardies and um and you're taking it easy up there mate uh, okay so we are going to kick off today with a quick recap of what really matters in all of this then we'll get into the meat of the sandwich What's the underlying problem we have to address in the off-premise today? That's the second bullet point. Then we'll connect some value dots together. And finally, uh, with Hannah's help, we're going to take a look at what different generations are doing in their liquor shopping behavior right now, today in 2023. Hope that sounds good, folks. Hope that's what you're expecting. And um, I'm hoping that's going to give you a lot of value by the end of the next 43 minutes. Give us a thumbs up if uh, if that sounds good to you. We um, we should probably, thank you, Hannah, uh, we should probably introduce ourselves. Uh, who's guiding you through all of this uh, this morning? I mentioned generations. We've got two generations involved in uh, in delivery today. Generation X, very obviously, is me on the left. Uh, very little hair left, uh, according to that photograph, uh, certainly right now. But I am still obsessed, regardless of the lack of hair, with um, facilitating collaboration. Because I'm a very, very strong believer that that is really the only way to grow in this day and age and in this market. Whether that be internal collaboration, whether that be collaboration between you and your trading partners, it is an absolute must. And that's something I'm obsessed about. But then we have another face, a new face to many of you. Um, that is Hannah Jukes on the right. Say hi, Han. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hannah joined us about uh, six months ago. She's been shopping in about six months. She's a Kiwi. She's, um, she's an absolute bundle of energy. And she is also part of uh, Gen Z. Very jealous, but, uh, but she is. Now, um, just quickly, I was going to ask you, Hannah, since you're fairly new to the um, mm -hmm. to the Aussie market, what's been your first impressions uh, of the liquor channel compared to what you used to back home in New Zealand? Um, I have to say that there's a much wider range of choices here, and it seems to be a bit more competitive within the market. Um, funnily enough, it's actually something we'll be answering later on, um, whether or not having a wide range is a good thing. Indeed, it is something we will look at. Yes. Um, wider range on paper mm -hmm. great fabulous fantastic but at what point does um does delighting customers tip into frustrating adding friction adding complication to the shopping experience yeah. definitely something that um, we're going to hear from hannah more on in a moment thank you hannah 
we will come back to you in just a second. Um, but let's set this one up. So that's that's us. We won't talk much more about us today. We're going to talk about you and what you guys are up to. So before we dive in, I'd like you to have a think about what you're trying to achieve, okay, and where you're trying to get to. Because that's what this is really all about. It's not about a bunch of data points. It's not about shiny PowerPoint presentations. So take a step back for a moment and consider how you actually go about getting the best outcome for your brand in your category today. I know we've got a lot of retailers on the call, uh, and this can apply in the same way for you as well, but I'm just going to uh, stick with the mindset of the supplier and the majority on this call for the moment. Here's a model that we refer to a lot. It's the shopper development model, and it has three stages. Three stages of maturity in uh, the conversations that you can have with your customers when you want to influence them to adopt your proposals. And when it boils down to it, that is, is it not what we all want to have happen? We all want to have that influence and for our um, internal customer or our external customer to adopt our proposals. Now, level one and two basically start with you, your brand, your targets, your goals. And then at some point, you apply some degree of category thinking over the top or alongside, uh, but it's really there to appease. It's really there as a bit of window dressing rather than something that is going to add value. And the end result as a consequence generally tends to be a sell to rather than a buy in from the retailer. Okay. But at level three, that's when you start to bake in this notion of category thinking. That's when you have uh, alignment with the retailer that becomes implicit and the centerpiece of um, the plan at this stage is of course shopper behavior shopper needs shoppers expectations so you really don't want to be spending any more time than you absolutely have to in that sell in it's difficult it's hard it's treacly it's like pushing water uphill where you want to be is much more in this alignment with your retail partner that's what's going to give you that green tick now, this is, this is nirvana, right? This is the goal. Um, if you're not there 100% of your time or, or your business is not there 100% of the time, don't worry. Very few businesses, if any, are there all the time. But I know from talking to a lot of you over the last couple of months um, that this is an aspiration right now. You want to spend more of your time in that level three territory. So let's please just have a quick poll to see what the mood is out there right now. Don't worry, this is anonymous. But tell us, please, I'm going to launch it now, where you believe your business spends the majority of its time right now. Is it level one, sophisticated selling, or level two, parallel thinking, or are you spending the majority of your time up there at level three, which is the nirvana, the joined up planning? I'm going to let that run for a moment or two while we move forward, and then we'll come back and have a look at those results. So I talked about that being the aspiration. What ingredients, therefore, do you need to get you there? From an insights perspective, you're certainly going to need the ability to answer the question, why? Why are things the way they are in my category? Why are we seeing the outcomes we're seeing today uh, that we want to try and replicate or change in the future? Because, of course, remember, at stages one and two, why doesn't really matter all that much, does it? because the brand agenda is all important. That's the focus, that's the emphasis. When you get to stage three and you want to get to stage three, why becomes critical. So you need something extra in order to get to that why. And many of you will be familiar, if not with this visual, certainly with the, the elements of it, because myself and my team, we talk to this pretty much every single presentation, every session that we run, every workshop that we run. So, the first pillar is the ability to identify those core, those foundational characteristics in your category. What makes it tick? That's really, really foundational. The next element is uh, around why, uh, what, uh, what, excuse me, why shoppers, what shoppers' needs are, um, how satisfied they are, what matters most to them. And the third foundational pillar is all about uh, how their buying decisions are made and influenced. Are they planned, unplanned? What triggers them in the first place? And if you've got even a basic appreciation for each of these pillars, then you've probably got the basic ingredients 
that you need to start to move to level three and to tell a compelling story that's going to win buy-in rather than be a sell to. You might need a few other things as well, which we maybe talk to another day, but you've got the absolute basics here in terms of uh, shopper insights. Now, let me touch back quickly on that poll. Uh, so where does your business spend the majority of its time right now? 23% uh, of you guys have said sophisticated selling. Okay, fair enough. Plenty of opportunity then to move at least into stage two as a next step um, and, uh, and find ways of doing that. Parallel thinking then is 59% of you, most of your time. So you've got some category thinking, it's in there, but it's very much running parallel side by side with the brand. And you're still finding yourself a lot in this uh, sell-in territory to the retailer. So life could be easier, life could be better. And um, again, we can help you to tell these stories and to move towards alignment. Um, and uh, great stuff, guys. Okay, 18% of you saying you are generally speaking in joined up planning, fantastic. You want to stay there. You want to keep going with that. Um, and again, you have to keep telling the stories. You have to keep engaging and you have to keep shopper at the heart of your thinking in order to maintain that position. So this is all good. Doesn't matter where you are today. It's about where you're trying to get to tomorrow. And this session is about helping you wherever you are on each of those levels. Okay, so you're aiming for joined up thinking. And you've got three foundational pillars that are, if you like, the essential building blocks for any good shopper centric story that you want to go and tell. So now let's get into the heart of building that story for 2023. We're not going to focus today so much on the DNA pillar. If you're a shopper intelligence subscriber, I encourage you to follow up with your insights manager and my team in the coming weeks and start asking questions about that. Get under the skin of what is happening with the DNA of your category. But the reason we're going to move on to satisfaction today is because we have a problem, whether it's in Houston or not, I don't know, but we have a problem. Uh, and it's a trend that we've been seeing, we've seen moving and has been moving in the same direction for a couple of years now. And from what some of you are telling me, it's starting to bite commercially now in some areas. So, Hannah, without further ado, over to you. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, it's certainly not the direction travel that the industry wants to see within the shopper satisfaction. Um, it's down year on year, but shall we quickly see how many of you can guess uh, what it is at the moment? Yes, indeed. Let's throw it out there, team. What do you think the overall satisfaction rating for the total off-premise channel is this year? Uh, give you a clue. Hannah just said it's gone down. Uh, for context, just in case any of you haven't got it on screen, you've got us on in the background. Hannah, what was it last year? Um, last year, our continuous survey of 20,000 shoppers rated the channel at 66% overall satisfaction. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so 66% last year. What do you think this year? Put it in the chat. We've got a bunch of... Ah, oh, Luke. Hello, Luke. Uh, great to see you on there. So 49 from Luke. Um, uh, so this should, should say slightly on the pessimistic side there. It's not, it's not as low as that. Um, we've had a 64 from Sydney HQ6F, Mr. Black. Goodness gracious. I don't know who that is, but welcome. Uh, 57, 55, 54. God, some of you are quite pessimistic. I have to say. <laughs> uh, Lee, 64, 62. Okay. Come on, uh, Hannah, put us out of our misery. What is the correct answer? Uh, so this year we are down to 64%. So the lowest level since 2020 and the biggest year on year drop since we started tracking liquor, which was uh, quite a few years ago now. Mm. Yes, indeed it is. Um, and you can see on screen, right? You can see the direction of travel. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while. Okay, some of you um, were, were more pessimistic than that. Uh, some of you got it spot on. Nancy's spot on as well. Well done. Um, <laughs> but clearly there's some work to do. Definitely. So uh, we can dig into this in, in a bit more detail so you can start to see where the changes might be coming from. Um, price, assortment, execution and product are the groups of factors that we bundle together to make it easier to pinpoint where you need to focus. And you can see on screen now a couple of things really stand out. Firstly, price measures are up year on year, a really good result because satisfaction of this area was actually down 3% last year. So the focus on good price and offers has been registered by shoppers. But you can see the decline in all three of the other groupings, most notably enjoyment, which is defined as how enjoyable it is to shop the category, is down 3% within execution. And premium, in other words, perceptions of values when shoppers trade up, 
that sits within product and is down 5% year on year. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and as you say, good result at the top, mm -hmm. not so good down the bottom. And again, I think it's interesting, Hannah, because you highlighted this notion of, and, and it stuck out to you, this notion of choice and range yep. and, um, uh, and how that's different and higher and more significant in Australia. And yet we're actually seeing that enjoyment in the channel, the, the, this notion that it's enjoyable to go to the off-premise um, mm -hmm. has actually dipped. Now, this is the sort of thing that we want to start digging into with you at category and retailer level. Where is this really playing out so that you can move towards a sweet spot between more range uh, and less range and more enjoyment and less enjoyment, just as just as two measures that we can track. And there's a whole bunch of others, which again, we're going to talk to in a, in a few more minutes. But interesting, certainly in terms of some focus areas already. Awesome. Um, so now a super value aspect of Shopper Insights is the ability to segment shoppers, not just by uh, what they bought or where they bought it, but how they made their purchasing decision. Uh, so just to touch on this quickly, it's always fascinating to compare and contrast the planned and unplanned shopper. So we know, of course, the majority of liquor shoppers plan on the specific category they buy before they get into store, which is about eight and 10 shoppers. Um, but that leaves about 20% of shoppers in the off-premise that are unplanned. They haven't decided on the category that they want to buy until they're in the store. So here we can see their uh, satisfaction scores. Uh, planned shoppers do over-index in satisfaction across all factors. And unplanned shoppers are less satisfied with the off-premise pr proposition in general. Uh, most notably, this appears within the execution bubble, um, like things in store, on shelf layout they're 10% uh, below uh, compared to the planned shoppers in this area. So David, if you want to win with that unplanned shopper, suppliers and retailers need to be working together to try different things that appeal more to that mindset. Mm, mm, absolutely, 100%. I mean, that, that point there about the fact that um, in areas like location store, mm -hmm. shelf layout, it's, it's a no-brainer in many respects. I mean, it's really obvious that if, if I am unplanned, um, I, I don't know what I was going to buy before I went into the store, then I'm going to need different things from, from the store layout and I'm going to expect different things. And remember, this is at all shoppers, all banners, all categories level. So as soon as you dig into any of these, any of these aspects, you're going to start to find bigger variances to average. Now, we don't want to spend the whole session um, depressing you and bringing you down on this point because there's a lot of good stuff within there as well. But I do, we do want to make the point that there's some challenges. But just quickly, Hannah, if we flip this view and look at it um, for the benefit of the people watching this today, yep. by product, by department, what do we see? Uh, so the cider department tops the pile at 67% overall satisfaction and RTD springs up the rear at 62%. Um, and if we look at the direction of travel, so compared to um, prior periods, wine categories were flat year on year, while spirits has dropped nearly 3% satisfaction in the last 12 months. Okay. All right. Thank you. So the next step out of that, guys, is uh, potentially to break that down and start looking at those, those ebbs and flows by retailer. Um, certainly, that's the next dimension to really try and pinpoint where your departments, where your categories are up and down as a, as a next level of analysis. All right. Thank you, Hannah. So as a takeout from all of that, I would say the starting point for every conversation this year really ought to be where's shopper satisfaction sitting in this category and this retailer and moreover, what direction is it heading in? And remember, this is not a once a year temperature check this is not a set and forget thing that you do in march and don't revisit it into in, until next march or at least it shouldn't be uh, subscribers to shop intelligence are getting four rolling mat updates a year specifically for this purpose so that you can be on top of this all year round okay so let's move on to something a little bit different now hannah touched on price and the improvement in overall satisfaction seen in that area price uh, offers fixed low price. Good outcome, good result. But how does that relate to value more broadly in the channel right now? And importantly, the sort of category decisions you might need to be making. Let's connect some dots. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we know already most shoppers are planned in off-premise. In other words, they've decided on the category that they're going to buy before they've even entered the store. And we know it's about 80% 
on average. It's very high. And it's returned to that level since COVID. It dipped to about 75, 74% through COVID. Um, so what that means, of course, is the majority of the influencing that you can do is going to take place pre-store. So then the next question is, if you want to be razor sharp and really pinpoint um, precisely the kind of comms that you want to have out there pre-store, you then want to know what it is that shoppers are actually planning based on. Now, in this area, uh, brand remains very, very strong. Right? 53% of shoppers in the off-premise say they plan to buy one specific brand. So vitally important. It's why I could walk out my door and I can probably see five very powerful liquor brand messages on bus stops and advertising hoardings within 100 meters of my uh, unit here. So that's good. That makes sense. Uh, but the swing that we're seeing gradually is more shoppers saying that they, as you see on the screen now, plan to buy the brand that represented the best value for money. Now, that might be a pre-store determination, but it also implies that now there's some thinking and some decision making that's going to take place and be carried over in store. So it was a plan notion, but the outcome is only going to be determined in store. So that's something to think about in its own right. A 15%, okay, that's on average, uh, goes up to nearly one in five if we think about under 34s and we look at their responses only. Um, relatively modest in absolute terms, but increasing steadily and beginning, of course, to challenge this ongoing notion that we've had for a number of years about premiumization in the channel. Although I'm not for one moment suggesting that um, value for money precludes premium products, but it does to me say that you'll have to work a lot harder in the coming months if you want to switch me into something that's $120 a bottle and it's sitting next to something that's $70 a bottle. And remember, of course, the other thing that Hannah raised a few moments ago was that uh, we've seen perceptions of premium products have dipped in their own right in quite a big way, <clears throat> excuse me, in the last 12 months. Uh, and as she said, that's perceptions of the, the delivery. Is it worth me paying that premium for this product? Does it taste better? Does it, does, it, does it serve me better than the standard product? So that's an important kind of dimension to think about. So more focus on those, um, those value for money brands. Now, let's consider another dot that we can connect to that. This is another really important metric in liquor. I'm usually willing to consider lower price brands that I'm not familiar with. Now, over the last couple of years, we've seen this very, very stable at 20% on average. But this year, we've seen it increase to 22. Again, you might say, well, that's not really that significant, David. And at total, total market level, I would agree that looks like a modest change on a fairly modest number. But when you start digging into this number, that's when you start to see some big differences. So we can look at it again by department and we see wine is up at 40% agreement with this statement. Again, fairly intuitive, but you know when you see it on the page in front of you, that's when you can start building it into a story. You've got some empirical evidence here. Spirits by contrast, all the way down at 15. When we look at it by age, what's interesting I think is it's actually not the youngest shoppers in the marketplace who are most open to lower price brands and to, to, to considering lower price brands or price fighter brands. Actually, it's the 30 to 34 year olds. Um, and it's also pretty striking how few over 60s uh, would step out of their well-known, trusted, loved, um, you know, tier one brands. So, so they are very loyal in that respect. Uh, but there are many other shoppers in the market who are uh, minded towards this sort of thing. Now, um, Obviously, for the purpose of this example, I'm building out a story for you around value and trying to demonstrate how we can connect these dots to tell that story um, out in the field or, or wherever you need to to get your, your plans across. In practice, what you might want to do is take this shopper and focus in on their behaviors right across the board. In other words, um, how do they perceive the role of uh, different categories? What are their key influences and triggers? And in doing that, you can build out a complete plot line when you see an elevated number on this metric in your category or with your specific and particular retail partner. So that is how I'd encourage you to take this forward with us to build out some different stories. There are other dot points and other dots we can connect here. For example, we are still seeing that the average liquor category um, in the off-prem is being associated with store-wide price competitiveness 
much more so than we see uh, we were seeing two years ago. In other words, and what that means is that shoppers are looking at the price and the pricing in category X and saying, that means the retailer is going to offer me good value and good price right across the store, right across the basket or trolley if it's a really big shop. Um, much more so than we than than we used to see being the case, and that has remained elevated. So, much more um, thought, therefore, has to go into price positioning from a retailer's point of view. Um, you know, this is not going to be a shocker given the the current climate in which we're living, but it also means that there's more need for collaboration around what actually signals value to shoppers in your particular category. Yeah, because there are clearly other levers beyond price that can come into this equation and can affect and, uh, and impact um, satisfaction and therefore performance. So to connect those dots that we just touched on, more attention being paid to price at category level um, as a gauge of overall retailer value. At the same time, more shoppers are not just open to and willing to, but actively planning to buy more value orientated brands. So the questions there are, have you got a strategy around this? Or how well developed is your strategy around this? Have you got the product and the ranging options to meet this need where it is most needed through the market? Different categories, different banners. If not, let's help you dig into that in more detail in the next few weeks and months ahead. Okay, folks. So, uh, that brings us neatly to the final chapter of today's story. We've talked about satisfaction and value, and we've alluded a couple of times to the differences that play out by age group. And if you've seen, again, one of our State of the Nations that I presented in the last couple of years, you will know that there have been some interesting themes around different uh, behaviours by age group. And we're going to touch on that now. That's where Hannah's going to round us out today. This, for me, is one of the biggest things shoppers have been telling us for the past four or five years. And in most cases, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say the channel isn't responding. Now, I don't say that off the cuff. I say that because there is very strong evidence to support that claim. And you're going to see it in just a moment. So, Han, some fundamental differences in the way different shoppers and different mm -hmm. generations shop for liquor, right? Yep, absolutely. Well, we can say with a high degree of uh, confidence that when shoppers intend to consume what they buy off premise, is determined heavily by their age. So these findings are largely consistent year on year. So we know if you're under 34, um, you're overwhelmingly likely to plan on consuming the same day. Could be in the next few hours, next few minutes, but certainly the same day consumption. Uh, 35 to 54 year olds are not that far behind, but the over 55s generally do not use the off-premise in the same way. They are as a rule planning their consumption further out. Straight away, this must get you thinking about certain things, range, layout, chilled space, pack format, pack size, and so on. Mm, mm, and so on and so on, right? Absolutely. Mm. I, I think, again, for me, and I, we've looked at these numbers for a few, a few years running now. Yes, the 18 to 34 number is very, very high, Hannah, isn't it? But actually, I think potentially what's more um, shocking, surprising, is the percentage of 35 to 54 year olds who shop in the same way. It's not really that different. And, and this just goes to indicate to me that those behaviors are bleeding in to the next um, uh, stage of people's lives. This, these are not behaviors that people are going to leave behind the minute they get to 34 yeah. because they are so baked in and so ingrained. Exactly. So it'll probably also get you wondering what those same day consumers are going to do with their liquor so it's a good question to ask so you can target that usage effectively in your pre-store comms as well as your in-store activations so to keep this simple for today we have two broad groups of consumption uh, first we have occasion like meal or party and then we have what you call general consumption so stocking up or an unspecified relaxing at home and again the differences are pretty stark by age group we can see uh, much higher scores and over indexes for the younger group in the top half of the slide. So that specific occasion, a meal, a party, or socializing. And younger sh shoppers certainly do like to relax at home with a drink, but are less like, uh, but much less so than their older relatives. So as a channel, 
we're really getting inside the mind of this immediate consumption, uh, occasion-driven shopper. Are we doing that? Are we attuned to what they might be looking for, interested in, and what they're willing to pay more for? Sometimes, undoubtedly, yes, um, but in a lot of other instances, highly likely not. Mm -hmm. Wonder what makes you say that. <laughs> And as David said, there is uh, here is the evidence for uh, that brings us neatly back to where we started, which was around our satisfaction. So for simplicity, we're going to compare the 18 to 34s and over 55s. Now, at the highest level of overall satisfaction, there doesn't seem to be that much of an issue. The younger group is a little under 64, and the older ones a little over, but nothing to hold the front page for. However, a big gap does begin to appear when we look by bundle of factors, and specifically when we look at execution measures. Now we've got something worth exploring. Yet in fact, that's still just the tip of the iceberg because what lies beneath the surface of execution are four, me four different measures. And three of them just so happen to throw up some big, big variances when you compare younger and older shoppers. Availability, on-shelf layout, and in-store location are the, bot are the three bottom scoring measures for 18 to 34-year-olds, and they're the biggest variances versus the all-shopper average. The bottom line is current store design and store thinking isn't doing it for the younger shoppers in our marketplace. So there's a huge, huge opportunity to get that moving in the right direction in the coming 12 months. Yes, yes. I think it's really fascinating, this correlation between uh, the way that younger people are shopping mm -hmm. and their perceptions of the experience in store at these executional levels. Um, and it brings us back again to what you said at the start, I think, Hannah, about um, choice and range. What good is that choice uh, to somebody in this 18 to 34 year old bracket mm -hmm. who's gone in uh, with a specific occasion in mind and for same day consumption? So it could be the next hour. It could be something that is really quite immediate and they can't find what they're looking for. Yeah. Um, they don't know where it is in store. And even when they get to the shelf, there's still um, some degree of confusion or uncertainty in terms mm -hmm. of trying to find the thing that they're looking for. So uh, yeah, I think this is where there is a, a huge, huge opportunity to really get a hold of this um, and face into it. And it might be difficult. It might be challenging. And, um, and you know, maybe there are some, some retailers on the call right now who, um, who have a view on how challenging it actually is. Um, and maybe it's it's going to be a particular feature or a particular opportunity for one banner more so than another. But there is definitely something here that I, I kind of call out to anyone on this this, this um, webinar this morning to, um, to investigate and to explore with us. We can pinpoint exactly which categories this is. We can pinpoint exactly uh, which, which banners and retailers this is a challenge in. We can even then go and look at what other behaviors are associated with this shopper to find out what else we need to do. So it might not just be about um, putting a, a chiller cabinet near the front door or stripping out a bit of range. There may be other things associated with this that, um, that you could do. And I come back to this idea of telling the most compelling story possible, connecting several dots to tell a compelling story. Um, Gab, hello. I just wanted to give you a shout out because I noticed you um, uh, put your response to the percentage earlier on in the Q&A and I just saw that. So um, so thank you very much. Great to see you. It's good to have you here. Hope you're doing well, mate. Hannah, thank you very much for that. Uh, very well done. I don't know if I mentioned, but this is Hannah's first ever live webinar. Uh, I think she's um, acquitted herself superbly. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so um, enough of the uh, enough of the back slapping and all that business. Let me just leave you folks with um, with a checklist for today. A few things to uh, rookie mistakes. Oh, it's all good, Gab. Don't worry, mate. <laughs> um, a few things to think about. Satisfaction at a total market level in the off premise is down again. Third year in a row. This is a consistent theme. This is a consistent story we've been telling. Eventually, if we think about this as being the lead measure, eventually this impedes, this hinders, if not, if not uh, diminishes sales, it certainly causes issues with sales. So now is the time to get forensic. Call us in, use myself, use the team to get forensic in your category and really understand 
where this is happening, how far it's going, and with which particular shoppers it's, um, it's an issue, and then build out the solution from there. Now is the time to do it, guys. Uh, and do that in conjunction with this, this parallel story or this embedded story around connecting the dots on value. Uh, more consideration, more planning, more, um, more willingness to trade into those price fighter or those value brands. Uh, so now's the time. Review the prominence, review the position, the role that they play, not just in the plan, but then in your ability to go and convey that plan and tell that story to your retail partners. And last but not least, um, I just think it's time we we face into this one as well. Let's move with it. General, 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 general generational behaviors, sort of what I was trying to say, are baked in. They're not going to go away, I don't think, anytime soon. Uh, that 80% in the in the lowest age group has been consistent, 81, 82, 81 for the last few years. And now I think we have the evidence we need to really change the status quo and to win younger shoppers. There are retailers out there who are uh, very, very keen to win this territory. They want to own, if you like, that space with younger shoppers. Lots of range rotation, uh, lots, of, um, lots of RTD innovation. Great. If that's working, fantastic. But if you look at your results and you look at these satisfaction figures and it's not, then challenge that status quo. Do it with a strong story. Do it by going and seeking alignment with the retailer rather than trying to sell in a plan to a retailer.